In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God makes a covenant with Abraham, promising him and his seed an area of land. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. This is the famed promised land, the area set aside specifically for Abraham and his descendants by God. The book of Numbers further articulates the exact borders of the promised land, which not coincidentally comprise much of the modern-day state of Israel. Israel is famous today for its democratic political system and its status as the world's sole Jewish state, but what is less known is how the country was developed prior to its independence in 1948. At the mid-19th century, the area that now makes up modern Israel was just another backwater territory of the decaying Ottoman Empire, with little to no Jewish settlement outside certain areas of Jerusalem. Contrasting this desolate image of Ottoman Palestine with the vibrant and influential status of Israel today begs the question, how was this achieved? The answer to this question lies in the founding ideology of the state of Israel, Zionism. Zionism isn't just relevant for the state's founding, but its continued existence even today. Ostensibly dressed up as a means of strengthening their national security position, Israel's occupation of the Golan Heights and its continued settlement of the West Bank are also guided by the Zionist desire to see the whole of the Promised Land to come under Jewish control. This ideological connection to the land itself gives Zionism a uniquely geopolitical orientation, a characteristic that makes it especially relevant to the study and analysis of the Middle East. Thus, if one seeks a better understanding of the Middle East and Israel's place in it, a thorough analysis of Zionism is a necessary prerequisite. To understand Zionism, one needs to understand the Jewish diaspora and the situation they faced in the late 19th century. The growth and development of the global Jewish diaspora had taken shape as early as the destruction of the first temple in 586 BC. But the destruction of the second temple at the hands of the Romans in 70 AD would be the event that cemented the Jews' status as a people with no land or state of their own. Spreading throughout Asia, Europe, and North Africa, the Jews of the diaspora would not undertake a meaningful effort towards statehood for nearly 2,000 years. Among a myriad of factors, the two most important trends that caused Jews, specifically European Jews, to begin efforts towards statehood were the rise of nationalism and anti-Semitism on the continent. Nationalism, like many things that would dominate Europe during the long 19th century, was a byproduct of the Napoleonic Wars. Having been conquered by the Napoleonic France and seeking restoration of their autonomy, populations in Germany and Italy began identifying less with their local principalities and duchies and more with aspirational notions of German or Italian identity and nationhood. The success of these national aspirations, manifested in the newly created Kingdom of Italy and German Empire, would result in the spread of nationalistic ideals throughout Europe and beyond. Concurrent with this rise in nationalism was the rise of anti-Semitism and the violent altercations that such sentiments gave way to. Scandals such as the Dreyfus Affair in France and the many pogroms carried out in the Russian Empire highlighted that anti-Semitism was not a localized phenomenon. Rather, the growth of anti-Semitism on the continent was a natural side effect of the rise of nationalism itself. By defining themselves as a distinct people of a nation, nationalists, whether intentionally or not, were forcing all other groups within the state to make a choice assimilate, or be considered an outsider. Thus, European Jews faced both positive and negative incentives to require statehood. There lie just one problem. How would they go about achieving this goal? Jews were dispersed across the entire world, and there was no concentrated area where they enjoyed full autonomy. Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and Mizrahi Jews all lacked statehood, but the nearly 2,000 years of exile had allowed each sect to develop distinct cultural and political differences. These differences added yet another layer of complexity and difficulty that the Jews would face if they tried establishing their own state. Even more critically, the Promised Land was in the possession of the Ottoman Empire, meaning that any plans of a self-governing state in Palestine would necessarily come at the expense of Turkish territorial integrity, thereby necessitating either the blessing of the Sultan or the backing of a great power, neither of which were luxuries the Jews enjoyed much less were close to acquiring. Luckily for those Jews seeking statehood, a man of great talent and influence would soon emerge to lead the Zionist movement. Though the impact of biblical characters such as Abraham, Moses, or David on conceptualized Jewish statehood cannot be discounted, there is perhaps no individual more important to the state of Israel, and specifically its reconstitution, than Theodor Herzl. Born in 1860 in the Austrian Empire, Herzl was initially a playwright and a journalist before returning into the staunch Zionist activist he would later be known for. Even more surprisingly, he was an outspoken assimilationist, advocating for the Jews of Central Europe to adhere to the cultural practices and norms of the Germanic peoples of that region. However, 
This assimilationist outlook would soon change to one of ardent Jewish nationalism. Having seen the Dreyfus Affair, as well as witnessing anti-Semitism firsthand in his native Austria, Herzl was soon converted to the cause of Zionism and began publishing pamphlets advocating for a Jewish state. It was also around this time that Herzl wrote Der Judenstadt and Alt Neuland, two pieces of Zionist literature that would lay out the founding vision of the political Zionist cause. Herzl would go on to create the Zionist organization, a group that would act as the main vector through which Zionist theories became policy. The creation of political Zionism and its associated institutions weren't just important for the sake of advancing Jewish interests, but for the movements its development helped counter. Prior to Zionism as a political movement, the Jews of Europe were realistically left with two bleak options, assimilate into their respective nation states and forfeit their Jewish identity or embrace the growing revolutionary movements that sought to overthrow the established regimes of the continent. Neither of these options would afford Jews their own unique identity that they desired, and thus Zionism was an ideal alternative for those wishing to preserve their cultural and religious identity. In short, Political Zionism was a viable alternative through which Jews could reject both revolution and outright obedience to the states seeking to destroy their culture and identity. But before we go any further, it's necessary we discuss Hegel. Born in 1770, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was one of the most important philosophers of the 18th century. His philosophical work spanned many subjects, but in particular, his focus on idealism is what landed him among the greats of the German philosophical tradition. Central to Hegelian philosophical theory on idealism is the concept of the Geist, discussed in Hegel's magnum opus, The Phenomenology of Spirit, and elaborated on in later lectures, the Geist represents the unbridled ideals and passions of an individual. Applied to a people or nation, it becomes the Volksgeist, the national spirit. Like the Geist itself, the Volksgeist is the idealistic dispositions of a people. This is not to say that Zionism is entirely a result of Hegel's theories, however, it is to say that metaphysically speaking, the concept of the Volksgeist and the reality of geopolitical competition are inherently in conflict with one another. The former represents the ideals of the group, while the latter is emblematic of the realities they face. When one is emphasized, the other is detracted and subordinated. Thus, finding synthesis in this competitive dichotomy ought to be the goal of any ideological framework that seeks to bridge the gap between what is and what ought to be. However, the juncture at which geopolitics and ideology derived from the Volksgeist converge is difficult to ascertain and even more difficult to synthesize. To circumvent this, some ideological frameworks incorporate geopolitics into the theory itself, notable examples being Atlanticism or Eurasianism commonly understood. The synthesis of ideology with geopolitics that these theories present allow themselves to be grounded in a geographic framework. Instead of constraining the ideology to a purely Hegelian idealism, as is often the case with ideological narratives, the existence of a geographic framework gives support to these ideals by integrating geopolitical assumptions within the ideology itself. In short, ideologies who incorporate geographic realities mitigate and even presuppose the detractive effects geopolitics inevitably has on ideological theories. Like the aforementioned ideologies, Zionism is significant not just for its impact on the contemporary Middle East, but for its geopolitical realities that were taken into consideration during its development by early Zionist theorists. Centered around Eretz Yisrael, Zionism sought to return the Jewish diaspora to their ancestral homeland. Today, this connection to geography may seem obvious. After all, the name Zionism itself is a reference to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and the word Zion is a colloquial name for Israel more broadly. However, this specific geopolitical connection to Eretz Israel was not always a foundational component of Zionist theory, nor was it ever a guarantee even among hardline Zionists. Perhaps influenced by his own secular upbringing, Herzl was initially averse to the notion of Israel's reconstitution in Ottoman Palestine. Given the issues surrounding the necessary consent of the Turks, as well as the Zionist movement's lack of support from any great powers, Herzl and his Zionist organization instead sought other locations to begin constructing their Jewish state. Despite meeting with the Ottoman Sultan as well as the German Kaiser, it would be Herzl's meetings with the British government that would bear tangible results. Influenced by both positive and negative feelings for the Jewish population within their country, British policymakers offered up a location for the Jewish state, a portion of land within British East Africa. Possessing virtually no development and sparsely populated by African natives, the location presented as a so-called Ugandan scheme was met with stiff resistance by those at the Sixth World Zionist Congress in 1903. The opposition to this proposal, enthusiastically endorsed by Herzl, 
stem from the demographic split within European Jewry itself. While united in the desire for a Jewish state, the composition of the Zionist Congress was divided in one critical aspect, their religiosity. Though not absolute, the Jews of Western Europe tended to be more secular and therefore less attached to the Promised Land than Eastern European Jews, despite enduring pogroms and arguably far worse conditions than their Western counterparts. The Jews of Eastern Europe were more traditional in their outlook on Jewish identity. They saw their identity as being intertwined with the biblical significance of the Promised Land. Thus, any proposals to create a state anywhere other than Palestine were deemed unacceptable, and the Zionist movement nearly fractured during this heated conference. After Herzl's death in 1904, just a year later after the conference, the British East Africa proposal would be left without its main advocate and would be subsequently dismissed at the Seventh World Zionist Congress in 1905. Though the Ugandan scheme had been a failure for Herzl and his more secular cohorts, the connection he established with the British government put the plight of the Zionist cause on the radar and had solved the most pressing issue facing the movement, that being the location of the future Jewish state. The fallout over the proposal exposed how the diversity of the Jewish diaspora would reflect itself among the Zionists. Despite nominally operating as a movement to establish a monolithic Jewish state, much of the theory and philosophy that comprised the Zionist movement was developed and articulated through a specific demographic of Jews, particularly those from secular and Western backgrounds. Despite their overrepresentation in the development of Zionist theory, this core vanguard was only but a small fraction of the actual Jewish population of the world, and as a result, their articulation of the ideal Jewish state was premised on certain ideological and cultural biases that weren't necessarily shared by other Jews of the world. This divide was exhibited most explicitly in the debate surrounding the Ugandan scheme, but remains a trend within Israeli politics even today. However, the fact that this influential cadre willingly acquiesced on the decision cannot be overlooked. In effect, the secular Western elites of the movement voluntarily shared their power and influence with other Zionists thereby enshrining ideological diversity as a component of the movement. Though such a move would ultimately weaken their influence over time, shifting power to the more religious Eastern European Jews, the decision saved Zionism from fracturing along religious and cultural lines. In short, the credibility of Zionism representing all Jews was not done through a theoretical framework, but through voluntary compromise between the secular elites and the religious majority. Having rejected the Ugandan proposal, and unified around their common goal of reconstituting the state of Israel and Palestine. The Zionists were still no closer to acquiring their mandate to the land than they had been prior to the dispute. Palestine was still firmly within Ottoman control, and the Zionist efforts to acquire a great power champion, be it London, Berlin, or even Constantinople itself, were unsuccessful. Though these efforts certainly weren't helped by the death of their erstwhile leader and chief advocate, the Zionists nevertheless began to settle and reconstitute their statehood within the legal bounds of Ottoman jurisdiction. Taking the form of waves of immigration called aliyahs, these ventures began as a gradual settlement of the territory by Jews fleeing direct persecution to those enamored by Zionism as an ideological experiment. The primary vehicle by which Zionists achieved their goals of land acquisition was the Jewish Colonial Trust, founded in 1888 the fund was the chief organization in the purchase and development of Zionist land in Ottoman Palestine. Supported by wealthy Jewish financiers like Edmund James de Rothschild of France and Moses Montefiore of Great Britain, the Jewish Colonial Trust sponsored the wholesale transfer of other 25,000 Jews to the territory between 1881 and 1900. The support of these financiers was critical, as the initial settlements were largely unprofitable. The money and resources provided by these donors would be instrumental in keeping the settlements from financial ruin in their most fragile stage. Given their fiscal problems, it is perhaps no surprise that early Zionist settlements attempted to offset their financial woes by employing avant-garde methods of economic and societal planning. While settlements of the first aliyah were almost entirely privately owned, later settlements took on an expressly collectivist disposition. Zionists believed that to reconstitute the state of Israel, they could not simply transplant the Jewish populations as they were in Europe, but that these Jewish settlers must adapt and acclimate to the Mediterranean environment they were settling. Thus, Zionist propaganda emphasized the transformation of European Jews into tan socialist laborers, ready to restore Jewish sovereignty to Israel. Beyond ascetic and ideological reasons, the socialist nature of the kibbutz settlements was also of practical importance. Grounded in collectivist theory, the kibbutz were structured so as to emphasize the communal needs of the settlers over those of the individual. In a territory such as Palestine, where Jews were a minority, this type of structured societal planning not only mitigated the aforementioned financial troubles, 
but also ensure that the settlements were safe from Arab incursions, a threat that would only grow as Zionist settlements expanded. In short, the socialist nature of the early Zionist settlers was as much a result of the class composition of the settlers as it was a necessity for the environment they were settling. As one might expect, the methods by which Zionist settlers acquired their land was just as, if not, more important as the planned societies they employed there. Despite possessing sites and landmarks central to Judaism, the initial Zionist settlement of Palestine did not focus on the holy city of Jerusalem. Efforts were made to purchase land in the city, but the Zionist movement found most success along the Sharon coastal plain and through the valleys leading to the Sea of Galilee. Largely purchased from absentee landowners, this N-shaped settlement constituted the lion's share of pre-statehood Jewish settlement in Palestine. While Jewish land acquisition and development was done deliberately to the exclusion of the natives, it should be noted that nearly all Zionist settlement prior to the 1920s was done within these legal boundaries. This was purposely done, of course, as the Zionists possessed neither the manpower nor the weapons necessary to take the land by force. Even if they did, they lacked a great power sponsor from whom legitimacy and protection could be afforded to them in the event of Ottoman or Arab counterattack. Thus, Zionist settlement was largely relegated to the coastal plain and valley regions of Palestine. Penetration into the foothills or urban areas of the province was less successful as the prices of land grants were much higher and the loaners themselves were natives, making sales to explicitly pro-Jewish organization difficult. This N-shaped pattern of settlement would come to dominate Zionist defense planning and strategy. Self-defense organizations such as Hashemer, the precursor to the Haganah and later the IDF as we know it today, were tasked with defense of these early settlements. Blurring the line between a police and military role, the creation of these militias was crucial not for just defending the settlements themselves, but for laying the groundwork for future statehood. Without a defense force, Zionist settlements would necessarily have to rely on the Turks for their security concerns. Only by creating and maintaining their own security apparatus, independent of that of the Ottomans or the Arabs, could the Zionists build a foundation for statehood that they desired. But, they still lacked the great power sponsor necessary for a larger mandate over Palestine. Luckily for the Zionists, an opportunity to achieve this goal was just on the horizon. That the cause of the Great War is still debated today is indicative of the multitude of strategic theaters of competition each great power had in the run-up to the conflict. The commonly cited cause is the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand by a Serbian nationalist, resulting in the ultimatum Vienna issued to Belgrade. The subsequent diplomatic back and forth of the July crisis is well documented, but what is less known is the strategic importance of the Middle East for the great powers involved. Despite both sides' professed focus of the war being on the balance of power in continental Europe, the Great War was also understood to be the contest over the fate of the Ottoman Empire. A patchwork of states today, most of the Middle East at the time was controlled by the Turks, whose relative power to the Europeans had been declining for almost two centuries. Whereas Great Britain had been a staunch supporter of the Turks in the face of Russian designs on the region during the 19th century, Recent investments in diplomatic overtures by the Germans had essentially made Berlin the chief sponsor of the port. Germany, having undertaken a naval buildup as a direct challenge to British strategic naval superiority, had, whether intentionally or not, created a substantial amount of anxiety among British policymakers and military leadership. Fears of Berlin dethroning London's dominance of the seas were so influential on British grand strategy that they were willing to forego their historic Middle Eastern rivalry with the Russians in favor of an adversarial posture towards Constantinople. Anti-Ottoman sentiments were further exacerbated by proximate British interests in the form of the Suez Canal and the huge deposits of oil in the Persian Gulf, both of which were critical for the upkeep of London's global empire. If the Ottomans were drifting toward client status under German lordship, then it wasn't out of the question that these vital interests would be within striking distance of a hypothetical Turco-German alliance. All this is to say that despite the Middle East being portrayed as a tertiary theater to the events happening in Europe, its importance to the grand strategy of Great Britain cannot be overemphasized. As a result, British intrigue on Ottoman territory began almost as soon as the Turks entered the war. Famous as the 1906 Arab Revolt may be, British geopolitical calculations on the region were initially focused on Ottoman Palestine and the aspirations of Zionist organizations had therein. In January 1915, the memorandum titled The Future of Palestine British cabinet members put forth their desire to annex Ottoman Palestine, in part due to the cabinet's official endorsement of the Zionist plans for the territory. The memorandum also made sure not to leave out the benefit that the territory would have as a frontier region for the defense of British interests in Egypt, namely the aforementioned Suez Canal. The British would also enlist the assistance of the Arabs in their planned partition of the Ottoman realm, corresponding with the Sheriff of Mecca, 
who already retained a semi-independent position under Ottoman suzerainty. British authorities in Egypt promised wide swathes of Arabia, Mesopotamia, and the Levant to the sheriff and his associates if he sided with London against Constantinople. As if the competing land claims of the Arabs and the Zionists weren't contentious enough, the British cabinet also engaged in secret negotiations with their French counterparts over the post-war order that they sought to create in the Middle East. To top off this flurry of overlapping territorial promises, the 1917 Balfour Declaration went even further than the 1915 Palestine Memorandum and would outright endorse the creation of a, quote, national home for the Jews in Palestine. Add to this overlapping web of promises the philosophy of national self-determination espoused by American President Woodrow Wilson at the time, and one begins to see the mess the British had created for themselves. Essentially, London had promised the same thing to many different people. These promises of territory were made in hopes of garnering support for the various factions they made these appeals to, all in an effort to undermine the strategic and territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Despite successes in the war, the stereotypical perfidiousness of British military officials and policymakers had put them in a position where it would be impossible to move forward with a partition that would satisfy all parties involved. The subsequent division of territory would be representing an amalgamation of interests, with priority of course going to the military-industrial needs of the Anglo-French alliance. Consequently, the already problematic animosity between Zionist and Arab populations in Palestine would only continue to escalate. Seeing as both parties had been given guarantees of statehood, only for the British to impose a temporary mandatory administration, they each felt that the other was implicitly halting their progress toward political autonomy simply by their existence in the mandate. Unfortunately, these feelings of resentment would come to dominate Zionist Arab relations for the next century. Zionist partnership with the British provided them with the great power sponsor they needed. With a shared interest of removing the Turks from Palestine, this relationship was one of mutual interest for both parties. However, it was not without its drawbacks. Though the support for a Jewish state was adopted as official League of Nations policy at the San Reno Conference in 1920, British policy in the Mandate soon took on an almost adversarial posture towards Zionist efforts. With Arab opposition to Zionism intensifying, the British had to choose between upholding their promises to the Zionists or acquiescing to the demands of the Arabs. London ultimately sided with the more numerous and influential Arabs. Under the pretext of trying to solve the ongoing settlement disputes between the two groups, London would issue a series of white papers throughout the 1920s and 30s. Preluded by official commissions on the state of the mandate, these white papers would effectively walk back the original promise the British had made for the Jewish state in Palestine. The Zionists had achieved their goal of expelling the Ottomans, but now they had to deal with the British and their increasing support for the Arabs. The great power sponsor had served its purpose. Now it was time to prepare for independence. It was against the backdrop of these white papers and the ongoing tensions with the Arab population that Zionists began laying the foundation for their eventual independence. The aliyahs into the mandate continued, spurred on by rising anti-Semitism that took root in much of interwar Europe. But the fact that most of these immigrants into the mandate came illegally was indicative of the power dynamic the Zionists now lived under. Though Britain had helped the Zionist cause during the First World War, her inability to make good on the promises made had disillusioned the Zionists, who once counted on London for support. Add to this equation, the reprisals Arab leaders like Haj Amin al Husseini had inflicted on the Jews of the Mandate, and one begins to understand why the Zionists began moving toward their objective of independence, oftentimes acting well outside the bounds of British law and overstepping their legal jurisdiction. But this raises a question. How does a political movement establish a state under such conditions? The Zionists enjoyed the support of neither the governing authority, the British, nor the majority of the Mandate's population, the Arabs. Consequently, Overt maneuvers towards independence without the express consent of the British simply were impossible. Even if the Zionists had the support of London behind them, the success that such a partnership would yield was not guaranteed, given how ineffective the British administration had been at quelling the ethnic conflict plaguing the mandate. If the Zionists wanted their statehood, they would need to devise a strategy independent of both the British and the Arabs. Toward this end, the Zionists began constructing what could be accurately described as a parallel society. Hallmarked by the establishment of the Haganah in 1920 and the Jewish Agency in 1929, these institutions served two key purposes, the transportation of Jews to Palestine and the defense and support of Jews already existing in the territory. Rather than rely on the British to carry out these essential services, the Zionists purposely went it alone on both fronts. Not only were the British averse to the idea of more Jewish settlers, but any responsibilities not taken up by the Zionists themselves would inherently have to be taken up by either the British or worse, the Arabs. Whether these areas of concern were the construction of infrastructure, 
Education, or security for the mandate, mattered little, as it was the fact that the Zionists would be completely reliant on these external actors for the function of their society. In other words, the Zionists made a deliberate effort to reduce dependency on any groups or organizations not sympathetic to or controlled by Zionist ideology. Zionists even revived Hebrew to further distinguish the society and state they sought to create from the surrounding predominantly Arab culture. Prior to its renewal as a national language, Hebrew was only used in select, oftentimes religious circumstances. The widespread adoption of this once ceremonial language was yet another example of Zionist statecraft at work, as its functionality went beyond just its communicative abilities, but its purpose as a unifying facet of the growing Israeli national identity. By reviving Hebrew, the Zionists were at once strengthening the new national culture while at the same time hearkening back to their ancestral Jewish state. These cultural developments were matched with the construction of physical infrastructure to afford the Jews even more territorial control over the mandate. Perhaps the most impressive of these operations was the settlement of the Negev Desert. Sparsely populated by Bedouins and almost completely devoid of Zionist presence, the Negev was originally slated to remain under British control according to the 1946 Morrison-Grady Partition Plan. Seizing on the lack of concentrated British opposition and under the cover of night, 11 caravans of Jewish settlers went and established settlements in the desert. Aided by Zionist organizations like the Jewish National Fund and the Mekrat Water Company, these settlers were able to deduct the British authorities who had been attempting to limit Zionist expansion in the area. Since the settlements were set up literally overnight and already had built up infrastructure in the form of water wells, the British were forced to accept the legitimacy of the Zionist claim to the Negev. Such a claim would prove to be valuable in the future as the Negev was, and still remains, a significant southern geographic buffer for the state of Israel. After the conclusion of the Second World War, the British position in Palestine had become untenable. Similar decolonization movements were spreading throughout much of their empire, but Palestine in particular was host to some of the worst sectarian violence in the world. Unable to reach a substantive partition agreement that would satisfy both the Arab and Jewish representatives, the British decided to rid themselves of their obligations altogether and rapidly began withdrawing from Palestine. At Haifa, the last British troops leave Palestine, and very few of them can have been sorry. As the tanks and soldiers went aboard the transports, the thought that a difficult and thankless job had been well done must have mattered much less than the prospect of going home. As per the 1942 Biltmore Conference and 1947 UN Partition Plan, David Ben-Gurion, and several other notable Zionist leaders officially declared the State of Israel on May 14, 1948, the day the last British soldiers left Haifa. Despite this remarkable achievement being the realization of over 50 years of Zionist planning and preparation, there was little time to celebrate. With the British administration gone, nothing stood in the way of the Arab states seeking to push the Zionists out of Palestine. It was with these aspirations in mind that upon the announcement of Israeli independence, seven members of the recently created Arab League invaded the fledgling country. Unable to count on official support from any other countries in the region, this war would be a fight not just for Israel's independence, but for the continued existence of Jews in the Promised Land. Luckily for the Israelis, the years of development of their parallel institutions would pay off. Despite being surrounded by invading Arab forces, the Israelis were able to defend the key areas of Zionist activity, specifically the aforementioned N-shaped pattern of settlement that stretched from the coastal plain into the Galilee region. While clustered in such a manner that made defensive maneuvers easy to carry out, the end was severely lacking in strategic depth. As a result, Arab forces purposely struck on all fronts, hoping to penetrate a breakthrough so as to overwhelm what little territorial control Israel possessed. But where the Israelis lacked in geographic defenses, they made up for in their superior military tactics and doctrine. By all accounts, Israeli military officers and troops were far better at waging war than their Arab counterparts. Though some have made the case that this disparity in military abilities is chiefly cultural, and there is some evidence for this claim, the effectiveness of the Israeli forces was helped owing to their training and development in conjunction with the British military. Much of the Israeli military doctrine developed in tandem with the knowledge and expertise provided to the Jewish soldiers and officers that served side by side with the British in both world wars. Whereas the Arab officer corps was composed mostly of those picked for their loyalty and not necessarily their skill, Israeli officers had the practical experience required to fight and win the 20th century conflict. The Zionist decision to utilize Western technology and doctrine would prove to be the deciding factor in their war of independence, as it was the vast amounts of weaponry and systems from the West that allowed them to broker an armistice with the Arabs following the UN-sanctioned ceasefire. Beyond the success the Israelis had during the conflicts both during and after their bid for independence, the pursuit of aggressive foreign policy was one of the most distinct characteristics of the early Jewish state. 
Perhaps the best exemplification of this was the ferocity with which former Nazi officials were pursued following their mass exodus from Germany to escape justice for their crimes. The Israelis went as far as Argentina to find and capture those escaped Nazis well after the war had concluded. The vehicle by which they accomplished these feats of international policing, heretofore unheard of by a nation so young in its statehood, was the Mossad. Despite Israel's small size, the Mossad has a history of conducting operations throughout the globe and in the cyber realm, giving Israeli policymakers and military officials an unprecedented amount of actionable intelligence on enemies both distant and proximate. The working partnership established between the Mossad and the IDF could only have come about thanks to the framework created by Zionist theory. As for contemporary Zionism, one would be remiss not to mention the practices employed by Zionists in the court of public opinion, especially within the context of the modern state of Israel. Perhaps given the inherently controversial nature of its founding, Israel has undertaken efforts to improve its image in the international community. Part of this effort is how Israel portrays its conflict with the Palestinians. Throughout the settlement of Palestine, and after the War for Independence, Zionist organizations and leaders were intent on diminishing the concept of a Palestinian identity, almost as much as they were for recognizing the Israeli identity. Given that the end goal of Zionism was the establishment of a Jewish state, any other ethnicities or peoples not within this in-group would inherently be subordinated to the will of the dominant Jewish population. As a result, Zionists immediately ran into the issue of the existing Arab population and the demographic implications such a large group would have on the future of the Jewish state. Though the Zionists were willing to enter an accommodating relationship, going so far as to agree to this two-state partition plan proposed by the United Nations, the Arab groups within Palestine were strongly opposed to such an agreement. Seeing the Zionists as just another vestige of Western imperialism, they took on a totalizing posture toward any plans of partitions that would see the Jews afforded their own state, even if they themselves would have gained statehood as well. Any attempts by the British or the United Nations to negotiate a solution in Palestine were thus met with non-compliance at best and violent hostility at worst. All this is to say is that it was the Arabs who took on the all-or-nothing approach toward negotiations with the Zionists and not the other way around. This isn't brought up to excuse whatever actions the Israelis have taken at the expense of the Palestinians, nor is it entirely unreasonable for the Arabs to feel this way, given that they have been the majority population in Palestine for over a thousand years prior to Zionist settlement there. However, such conditions did necessitate the Zionists to reject and even destroy any semblance of Palestinian identity or national aspirations as a means of reducing Palestinian power and organizing ability. Toward this end, Zionist institutions and those sympathetic to Zionist causes have taken on all manners of argumentation to discredit not just the cause for a Palestinian state, but the concept of a Palestinian nationality itself. They often argue that no Palestinian identity or nationalism was present prior to the influx of Jewish settlement in Palestine. They also correctly assert that invading Arab armies of 1948 had no intentions of establishing a Palestinian state, but rather had their own territorial designs on Palestine. Palestinians themselves were acutely aware of this fact, as Palestinian refugees were turned away while trying to flee into countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. The fact that states ostensibly aligned with Palestinian cause were themselves unwilling to support an independent Palestine plays well into the Israeli narrative of discrediting Palestinian aspirations for statehood. Finally, Zionists are unwavering in their most core belief that they are the original and rightful owners of the Holy Land, as stipulated by God and his covenant with Abraham. Appealing to heaven may be the oldest justification for acts of conquest, but its value as an argument remains persuasive, especially among religious audiences. Despite losing London as a great power sponsor, Following the British departure from Palestine, the Israelis quickly found a new, more powerful great power supporter, the United States. As one might expect, the reasons for initial American support of Israel were strictly geopolitical in nature and followed the same line of thinking as the British, namely, Israel's proximity to the Suez Canal and its position in the oil-rich Middle East. While these are strategic reasons that would merit support from Washington, the same can be said for Saudi Arabia or any number of Western-oriented states in the Middle East. Really, the reason why Israel enjoys such staunch support from Washington and where it differs from other states with similar geopolitical conditions is its appeal among evangelical Christians. Spurred on by messianic beliefs about the significance of a Jewish-controlled holy land, support for Israel among evangelicals far outpaces the general populace and the importance that such a demographic plays in American elections has resulted in a significant portion of policymakers holding similarly supportive views, regardless of the American geopolitical concerns in the region. As one might expect, it is easier to justify support for Israel through a religious framework 
than it is from a cold, dispassionate geopolitical outlook on foreign policy. Supplementing this support among evangelicals is a massive apparatus of Israeli lobbying groups, composed mostly of evangelicals, diaspora Jews, and national security hawks. The American and Israeli lobby has close ties to the Israeli government and is one of the most significant forces in American politics. The coalescence of these three interests, the geopolitical value of Israel as an ally, the evangelical desire to see biblical prophecies come to fruition, and the influential Israeli lobby have earned Tel Aviv an unparalleled amount of support from the United States in the contemporary era. Though seen by its proponents as a natural continuation of Jewish statehood in Eretz Israel, the foundations and growth of political Zionism was largely a result of the broader trend sweeping Europe in the mid to late 19th century. That the rise of nationalism and anti-Semitism coincided with the formation of the political Zionist movement is not a mere accident, as it was precisely these movements that highlighted the vulnerable position that the Jewish diaspora found themselves in. While some Jews assimilated and others pursued more radical movements, a small but motivated contingent of Jewish intellectuals, mostly from Western Europe, began theorizing and laying out their vision of the idyllic Jewish state. Part of this cadre was Theodore Herzl, whose interactions with the great powers, though unsuccessful, ensured their future involvement in Zionist affairs. The diasporic nature of the Jews, as well as the coveted land of the decaying Ottoman Empire, made Herzl's proposition too good to pass up, ultimately culminating in the Balfour Declaration and the assistance of the British in securing Palestine for a Jewish homeland. Although the relationship was sour almost as quickly as it had been forged, the erasure of the Turkish yoke over Palestine and the subsequent destabilization of the region would prove to be the Zionist benefit. The ensuing decline of the British Empire, as well as the deteriorating situation in interwar Europe, allowed Zionists to grow and expand their base of power within mandatory Palestine, all while taking in hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants against the wishes of London. The parallel society that was built in preparation for the eventual British departure would prove worthwhile, as the victory Israeli troops achieved in their war for independence against the Arabs was largely a result of the planning and development they had done during the mandatory period. But even in victory, their position within the Middle East was still vulnerable. Though they were able to beat back Arab incursions again in 1967 and once more in 1973, the Israelis lacked a reliable great power ally for the first three decades of their statehood. This need for a powerful guarantor would be remedied thanks to the marrying of strategic and religious interests in the form of the United States. Israel's security posture today is largely a result of the close partnership with Washington, whose affinity for Israel is half geopolitical, half ideological. Acting as the arbiter of the region, the United States has assisted in the normalization of relations between Israel and much of the Arab world, all but securing Israel's permanent position within the region. In conclusion, the profound influence Zionism has had on the history and character of the Middle East is undeniable. What was once viewed as merely a dream of early Zionist theorists has grown into a reality that has shaped the Middle East as we know it today, a testament to the ever-shifting nature of geopolitical competition. Whether you're an ardent supporter or a firm opponent of Zionism, the fruits that it has borne cannot be ignored. Consequently, if policy and decision makers seek to influence the Middle East, much as the Zionists did, they cannot do so without recognizing the power Israel now wields within the region. Part of this recognition is a balanced understanding of Zionism, an understanding without the ideological bend that has become so commonplace in discussions surrounding the state of Israel. Rather, one must take a page from Zionism itself and deal with the realities of the Middle East not as they ought to be, but as they are. Only then can stability return and the cycle of conflict that has plagued the region for over 100 years be broken. If you enjoy this style of content, please consider subscribing as I plan on making more videos just like this. This is American Satrap, signing off.